what a rich experience it has been today. Our journey, four years and three weeks, comes to an end today. It's really with much mixed emotion I stand. Understanding that when you're assigned, you will be moved. But I give God thanks for the time he was able to allow us to connect. Um, want to thank my elders today. Some great men and women who this church has chosen to affirm to be spiritual leaders of your church. I shared with the incoming pastor that he has come into a great situation because he has elders, all ten, who are men and women of integrity. All ten. Who will not simply go along to get along but they lend good and solid counsel to their pastor. And elders, I want to say publicly again, thank you for your time of service to me and to God's church as we labored here together. You might be seated. I know the program as outlined and put together has to be an intentional effort by persons. Certainly I want to acknowledge all those who had an, a hand in, a thought in, but in all that has transpired today together. I'm a little sad because my mother is not feeling well. Um, She's always with me and holding up her, in Jamaica they call me the wash belly. Uh, that means the last child of the batch. Um, so she holds up her little son's hands and, um, you know, when mom sees me, it's Kirk. And I love it. And so I miss my mom not able to be here today. She and my dad were here along with my sisters and other family members as we got installed some four years ago. My heart is again sad because my, my father, who was one of my biggest supporters, one I would bounce many things off has fallen asleep in Jesus. And the truth is, there still remains a void in my heart, in my life, because there's something special that fathers who care about their children bring. So I stand this morning joyous on the one hand because you're getting a good pastor. Pastor Francois is my good friend and dynamic preacher. He loves people. A visionary leader. A younger man than me. So for those who think I'm an old guy, well the old guy is moving off the scene. And you'll welcome a younger man. Amen somebody. Pastor Francois is said a good friend of mine we've shared. He's been here before. He's preaching. We had the seven last words of Christ both occasions here and when I was in Gainesville. And his wife Erica, my wife Erica, our families are close and we share much together. They're coming with two young children. Um, pray you'll support them and hold up their hands. 
transitioning for the pastor is challenging. I remember, I'm trying to give you a little hint, all right? Hint, hint. I remember when my wife and I were transferred from Gainesville to South Florida. Um, we left a less expensive area to come to a more expensive area. And for almost two years, my wife was without a job. We met many a dark days. Many a times we went home by ourselves and we wondered as we looked in the refrigerator and saw lights and water. And here I am pastoring a church with over 500 and I'm going home with a wife and kids and the pastor of this large church is having a hard time sustaining his family. So ministry comes with its joys and its pain. I share that with you to say this. When your new pastor arrives, remember his wife might not be working right away. Remember, he's leaving a less expensive area to a more expensive area. Remember, because your pastor is unable to give you his very best if he is challenged and struggling. I'm saying that out of a heart because I felt what that was like. So I'm admonishing my church as I depart from you today. When your new pastor comes and his wife doesn't have work, remember, it's tough. It's challenging. Ask him. Put something in his hand. Put something in his wife's hand. They will appreciate it. Because I have been there with a wife and three kids and leaving this church to go home. Not sure at times how we going to even eat. But through it all, those two challenging first years that God blessed and God provided. And we thank God. There are those in our church today who, as I leave, my family and I, we, we will be friends forever. Some folks who have just loved on us and cared for us and about us. Um, who are just genuine people. They're not looking for anything. They're not trying to, they're just genuine people who just love their pastor and love the pastor's wife and love my kids. And you've shown yourself friendly. You've shown yourselves to be awesome people. And on behalf of my wife and our children, we say thank you. I want to express thanks to our music ministry. Um, I'm going to miss this dynamic worship. Oh, you got something going on here. But we hope when we go, we can create a similar environment as we bring folks into God's church. So to our musicians and our praise team and our choir members and leaders, I say thank you for your service to God and God's church, your commitment to the Seventh-day Adventist church. I want to thank our deacons who serve with excellence, our deaconesses, our ushers, our greeters. Um, the church functions well because of your consummate commitment to Christ and his work. I want to give a special shout out to my communications team. Jessica, where, where Jessica? Where Jessica at? Girl, you're awesome. And I love me some Jessica Garcon. Amen, amen. I love me some Jessica. She is a patient, wonderful young lady, um, spiritual, God, godly girl. And I pray, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying for you, girl. Amen, amen. Uh, church clerk, Sister Peggy Joseph. I love you, Peg. Um, awesome, awesome woman of God, and we thank God for you. Um, I want to also, lastly, just say thanks to Luma and those who work and Jandra in the technology ministry. Um, much of what we see happen here, I, I give them a lot of grief sometimes. 
but I thank God for them. Uh, we don't pay attention to the technology folk until the mic starts squeaking. Then all of us are, start having whiplash, you know, looking what, what's going on. But they have a challenging work ministry that they perform each week for us to have service with excellence in Luma and your team. I want to say um, thank you to you as well. Lastly, to our church board. Um, the board is called by God to be a spiritual agency of the church. My prayer is that our church board will continue to work well together cohesively as they advance mission and ministry in God's church. As I leave you today, uh, we're going not too far away. I'm going to the Alpha Agape Church in Lebanon. Will not be so far. Um, I want you to stay and be committed to your church here at Pisgah. I see many today who I haven't seen in a long time. But I'm glad that you're here today. Uh, maybe you came and let me leave that one alone. And I thank God for you being here. Um, every now and then, every now and then, you know, drop by. Every now and then, just drop by and say hi to me and the family. We'll do our hearts good as we see you would come by and, and visit with us. Elder, it's good to have you today. It's a good surprise. Good to have you and um, those from the conference office as a part of our team. In our last message this morning, I want to share a word with you coming out of the book of Revelation chapter 19. And I want to lift up just about three or four verses in your hearing beginning at verse 6. Revelation the 19th chapter beginning at verse 6 through verse 8 or 9. Would you be so kind to stand with me in honor of the reading of God's word? For those who are joining us in the fellowship hall in our overflow area, we thank God for you and your being here on today. Revelation chapter 19, beginning at verse 6. The Bible says, And I heard as it were a voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said, unto me these sayings are true true sayings of God I'm gonna pause right there I wanna tag this text with a simple title this morning simply be faithful be faithful look to your neighbor to your left and say neighbor oh neighbor pastors told me to tell you be faithful Ah, uh, that might be the wrong neighbor. Look to the next neighbor and say, neighbor. neighbor. Oh, neighbor. Oh, my prayer for you, neighbor, prayer. is that you remain faithful to God. Amen. 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 Father, now as we open your book to take a look, your word, your voice to be heard, speak a word, God, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. You might be seated. The enemy's aim, ploy, plan, plot, and purpose 
is to destroy, dismantle, and disassemble your faith in God. Because he knows that this is the victory that overcomes the world. Even our faith, faith is the victory. The truth is, this world is wrapping up. And he that shall come, will come, and will not tarry. Ready or not, Jesus is coming back. And so it behooves us as we worship today, as we lead lives of faith and trust and confidence, that we have and exercise a faith in God that's unmovable. A faith in God that's unshakable. Listen to the counsel Ellen White gives the church. Testimonies, volume 9, page 11. Highlighting the urgency of the day and the hour. Highlighting the fact to us that we are living in perilous times. Here is a counsel to God's church from the prophetess of God. She says the agencies of evil are combining their forces and solidifying their forces. They are strengthening for the last great crisis. Great changes are soon to take place in our world. And the final movements will be rapid ones. God's church has fallen spiritually asleep. As Seventh-day Adventists, for many of us, do not understand the ministry and the mission of God's church. The devil has hoodwinked God's church into thinking that we are here to fuss and fight against each other. There are those who leave their homes and dress beautifully every Sabbath to come to church to wield power and authority. God will not have his church without a witness. The final movements will be rapid ones. How shall we stand in that great day? Many are the sermons I've preached over these four years. Many are the Sabbath school lessons I hope you have read and studied over these last four years. Why are you here? Why are you at Pisgah? Why are you a Seventh-day Adventist Christian? Earth's final events are wrapping up and Jesus is soon to come. God does not leave his church in the dark. He gives his church a revelation. He gives his church some clear way marks. He gives his church some guidance and some direction. We are a prophetic church. We are a church that believes in Bible prophecy. We are a church that believes that even on this date, October 22nd, 1844, this church experienced what we called the great disappointment. Those who have studied God's word looked earnestly and expected and anticipated that Jesus Christ would have come at that time. 
only to find out when we went back and reassessed and reanalyzed and study again with more prayerful urgency that Christ did not come but he simply moved from the holy place and went into the most holy place. It is there where Christ is now and he is interceding for you and for me. There are those who will seek to tell us we don't need to read Revelation. We don't need to study Revelation because some say the book has been closed and to open it will seek to tamper with its integrity and its authenticity. Yet the book of Revelation, my brothers and sisters, is the necessary supplement for all else in scripture. Can I preach my last sermon this morning? It is here in the book of Revelation where the whole panorama of God's battle with evil unfolds. It is here in the book of Revelation that we behold the beautiful rainbow that spanned the starry skies of human history. It is here in the book of Revelation that we are able to listen to the terrible thunder of the, that great and dreadful day when the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and our God. It is here in the book of Revelation that we behold Christ, the man of sorrow, acquainted with grief, transformed into King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It is here in the book of Revelation that we see Christ, the bridegroom, coming to the, his bride, the church. Now, as to the identity of the author, there is little controversy because we are told that because of his uncompromising commitment to Christ, the Bible says that John was banished to the Isle of Patmos by Caesar Domitian. Attempting to distinguish John's flame, he ordered John to be plunged into a cauldron of hot boiling oil. But scripture records and reveals to us that that did not kill him. Why? Because the authorities did not know that in plunging John into this cauldron of hot boiling oil, they were actually baptizing John afresh. They didn't understand that oil symbolizes and oil represents the Holy Spirit. So as they thought they were baptizing John to kill him, they were plunging him to kill him. Jesus would have it that they were baptizing John afresh with power from an, I don't have a church in the building yet. John, the Bible says now, was an old man. He was 90 years of age when he was banished to suffer the isolation and intended punishment of Patmos. And we wonder why God would permit such a fate to befall a child of his in his twilight years. Why would God allow John to experience the clinching fist of imperial Rome at this point in his life. The Bible gives us an answer. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12. The Bible says, All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer. Is there anybody here who is willing to live godly for Christ? Because we know that if we intend to live godly for Christ, the Bible says this road of faith that we travel, this pathway of faith that we navigate. The Bible lets us know that it will meet us with some trouble. It will meet us with some trial. It will meet us with some adversity. But when I read the end of the story, it tells me that Jesus Christ, the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the earth, it tells me that Jesus Christ has won the victory. Is there anybody here who is going through a Patmos experience now.
the devil has dispatched you to a place of pain, a place of punishment, a place of adversity. But God will use what man meant for evil and turn it around for his good and for his glory and for your good. Is there anybody here who God has blessed, who man has told you you'll never achieve and you'll never accomplish and you'll never make it and you're not one of my favorite sons or daughters, but God so would have it that he organizes your life in such a way that all the evil man intends to perpetrate against you. God use those as a stepping stone to propel you and is there anybody here who are just believing that all things the good things and the bad things the persecution the depression everything that God will work all of them together for my good and for his glory we must understand that what God does not prevent God permits and what God permits is for your perfection that nothing happens to the child of God that meets God by surprise it may surprise your husband it may surprise your wife it may surprise your preacher it may surprise your church members it may surprise your family members but God is never surprised everything that happens to us God in his permissive will allows it we must understand that not everything that happens to you is about you. Domitian thought that John was going to wilt and die under the pressure at Patmos. John's, John's placement at Patmos and John being sent to Patmos was meant for a punishment. John was sent to Patmos to die. But God worked it around. That what Domitian meant for evil. That God had his hand on John's life. John had a faith in God. A trust in God. And a relationship with God that John did not look at what man was doing but what God was getting ready to organize in his life and that is why my brothers and my sisters John could have become disillusioned and discouraged and despondent John was sent there so his faith in God would wilt and die it seemed as though the body of John would not succumb to the brutal punishment at Patmos. Day after day, the trial at Patmos rolled war on John. If you were to look closely, it would seem vividly clear that his body was going down. Ah, but bless the name of God. John had faith in God. How do I know? The Bible says, Revelation 1 and verse 10, that John was in the spirit on the Lord's day. That John understood his call. John understood his ministry. John understood his call. And that which was meant to punish John. The Bible says led John on his knees. Led John to a closer walk and a closer relationship with God. John was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Oh, I wish this morning that somebody in Pisgah would be in the spirit on the Lord's day. While at Patmos, John did not forget the Christian calendar. John did not forget that his life was in God's hands. John did not forget that God was the head of his life. John did not forget the biblical Sabbath. He was physically by himself. But spiritually, John was with God. Huh? Though he had to suffer the isolation and intended punishment of Patmos, his faith and trust and co 
commitment to the cause of Christ was unwavering. And so the Bible tells us that John was in the spirit on the Lord's day. John did not have a praise team. John did not have a choir. John did not have Terrence Clayton to work his fingers on the organ. But the Bible says John had a relationship with God. John had a walk with God. John had a knowing of God and God had a knowing of John that no matter what situation and what circumstances John faced that John was not buffeted and allowed his situation to determine his worship. John said I have this faith that burns in my heart. Can I preach it this morning? John said I have a relationship with this man called Jesus. So devil you may send circumstances that may try to daunt my faith. You may send circumstances to bring tears to my eyes and pain to my heart. But John said I'm in the spirit on the Lord's day. Why? Because I have a relationship with the master. Little did Domitian know that John was sold out to Christ. As John prayed, the Bible says he was caught up in an apocalyptic vision. As eternity bursts into view, the old man, the Bible says, now receives a revelation from God. Is God not good? That in the midst of John's despair, in the midst of John's despondency, that God did not leave John. I'm preaching to somebody here today. You may come feel discouraged and disp get this word in your spirit that God will send help, that God will reveal himself, that God will send a divine revelation that in the midst of your pain and perplexity that God will dispatch a blessing. <laughs> Pat Most became the grandstand from which the poet John was able to view the panorama of human history. It was Joseph who declared, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it for my good. God has a way. God has a way of turning your dark days into bright days. God has a way of using your pain to propel you to prosperity. God has a way to use your adversity and turn them around for a blessing. Someone once called this God's cosmic recycling program. It was Paul who tells us that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to all things the good things and the bad things God will take them and God will touch them and God will use them and God will transform them for our good and for his glory Domitian thought surely the old man is going to wilt and die under the pressure of Patmos but John had a faith John had a relationship. John knew somebody who will hold him in the dark days and will hold him when the tears are flowing. And John said, it is this God I hold firm to. John now wrote the immortal message which for 20 centuries have become the great apocalyptic epic of all literature. If there had been no Patmos, there might not have been a revelation someone once said no pain no gain the things John saw and heard comprises the book of Revelation chapter 19 records a shift of thought and focus prior to chapter 19 John was seeing things now now from chapter 19 onwards John is hearing things after Revelation 19 verse 1 the Bible says after this I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven, shouting. It was in heaven. There are those in the church 
who believe the church should not shout. There are those in the church who believe the church should always be quiet. But the Bible says, after this, that's what the Bible says. After this, John says, I heard something. And when John peeked around the corner and his ears perked up, John says, I heard a sound ah, like the roar of a great multitude in heaven. And what were they doing? John says, they shout, hallelujah, salvation and power to God for true and just are his judgments. By the time we hear the multitude shouting hallelujah, much has already taken place. The messages to the seven churches have been given. The seven angels have sounded their trumpets. All the judgments have, have, have been pronounced and executed. Babylon have been uh, uh, commanded, com co condemned, and the people of God had been summoned to escape the wrath of God. Much has transpired. Go with me to chapter 18, verses 2 and 4. The Bible says, after this I saw another angel coming down. Revelation 18, 2 and 4. After this I saw another angel coming down from heaven with a mighty voice. Again, the Bible says, shouted. There is a lot of shouting in heaven. And I thought that earth was a preparation for glory. So if they shout in glory, I can shout in Pisgah. If they shout in glory, I can shout down here. The Bible says God's glory, God's kingdom is filled with shouting. Why? They shout because great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. They shouted because God is, they shouted because God is marvelous. They shouted because God healed them. They shouted because God restored them. They shouted because God healed them. They shouted because God cleansed them. They shouted because God will ultimately save them. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having a mighty voice. He shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Verse 4, Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so you may not share in her sins, and that you may not share in her plagues. I, I, I prepared, I prepared, I prepared, I prepared, and I won't be able to preach them here. I prepared seven sermons on the seven trumpets, and seven sermons on the seven seals of God. And seven sermons on the seven churches. I will not be able to preach them here, but I preach them where I'm going. I prepared because I understand that we are living at the toenail. And the church must get its spiritual act together. Seven trumpets, seven plagues, seven seals, seven churches. What those mean for us? Hmm. I preach them when I get to my other place. By the time we get to chapter 18, we see the faithful saints of God being hunted and slaughtered. The kingdom of the Antichrist have been overthrown. Gross darkness has covered the earth. Christians are unable to buy or sell. And all appears to be lost. Ah, uh, but just in the nick of time. Just in the nick of time. Uh, the righteous judge, Jesus Christ himself, re-emerges on the scene. He breaks through the clouds and reverses everything. So John declares in chapter 19 and verse 1, after these things, the question is, what? things after the complete destruction and condemnation of Babylon Babylon the city which have been the agent of hatred and murder Babylon the seat of the Antichrist so John declared after these things after Babylon is destroyed after God has come to save us the phrase after these things has nothing to do with chronology it means the prophet has received another vision. 
Four times in this passage we see the word hallelujah. In all the New Testament, this is the only place it appears. In the Old Testament, it appears 24 times. In the book of Psalm, many times we pronounce the word hallelujah with a J. But it really should be pronounced with a Y. Hallelujah is a translation of the Hebrew word Allah and Yah which means praise the Lord. Psalm 104 and verse 35 forms the context of the usage of this word. Let the sinners be consumed out of the earth and let the wicked be no more. Bless thou the Lord, O my soul. Praise ye the Lord. As the curtain lifts on chapter 19, heaven rejoices over the downfall of Babylon and the godless reign of the Antichrist and apostate Christianity. Babylon represents the, 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 the rebellion of mankind. But God will not allow Babylon to get away with the callous and calculated murder of the people of God. The saints, the saints have been long awaiting this moment to prove the justice of God. The Christ haters had been given every opportunity to repent and believe. But the Bible says they refuse. And so God must act. Psalm 104 and verse 35. Again, the Bible says, let the sinners be consumed out of the earth and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise ye the Lord. It is here when the character of God will finally be vindicated. Do you know that God's character will be vindicated? It will be vindicated when he shall come. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It will finally be proven that God is just. God is fair. God is righteous. God is loving. God is kind. God is long-suffering. God's character will be vindicated. And because he will be vindicated, he is worthy to be praised. He is worthy of the honor. He is worthy of the glory. God is to be praised for his power. Praise him for his character. Praise him for his love. Praise him for his kindness. Praise him for his fairness. Praise him for his salvation. Praise him for his might. Praise him. I declare that God deserves to be praised. That God deserves to be worshipped. Let everything that has breath give God the praise. I'm almost done. Back in chapter 4, John saw 24 elders falling down, worship before him. These 24 elders lay their crowns before the throne and said, You are worthy, O sovereign God. We need to know that all the plans of God have but one purpose, and that is that we worship God in the beauty of holiness. Worship will be our full-time job in heaven. What we have experienced this morning will be what our days will be like in glory. Some of us will never make it to glory because we can't handle all this worship. But this is what worship is all about. This is what glory is all about. We will spend the rest of our days in worship to God. The 24 elders worship saying, Amen. Hallelujah. Revelation chapter 19, 6 to 8, the Bible says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, shouting, Hallelujah, for the Lord God, omnipotent, reigns huh let us be glad and rejoice verse 7 and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife hath made herself ready 
And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. One of the metaphors in scripture, uh, scripture affirms, is a church as a bride and Christ as the bridegroom. The church or the bride is comprised of those who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. In order to understand what's transpiring here, and this is my last thing I'll say and I'll sit down. In order for us to understand what's happening here, we must understand the ancient Hebrew wedding custom. The ancient Hebrew wedding custom was, consisted, consisted of three things. The betrothal, or what we call today the engagement. Then you have the ceremony, and then you had the supper. The Jewish bridegroom would go to the bride's home carrying three things. He carries a dowry, he carries the contract, and he carries some wine in a wineskin. The bridegroom would speak to the father of the bride, who would summon the bride to his house. If the bridegroom's proposal was accepted, a trumpet would sound, huh? announcing their engagement. Even though the wedding had not yet taken place, they were considered husband and wife. But they could not consummate the marriage until the wedding day. The engagement was a legal contract between the two families. The bridegroom then left the bride's house and went to prepare a place for the bride. Did not Jesus say? <laughs> Ah, ah the, uh, did, not, did, did not Jesus, the bridegroom, say in John 14 and verse 3, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. On Calvary, Christ paid the dowry. With his blood, he purchased his bride. And he has gone to prepare a place for his bride. It was the father of the groom who set the date of the wedding. No one knows but the father. But of this, of that day knows no man, not even the angels in heaven, but the father only. Because of this, the bride had to be in a state of constant readiness because she did not know when the bridegroom was coming. When the father of the bridegroom decided it was time for the wedding, a second trumpet was sound. This was called the last trumpet for the Bible says for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet sound of God. Then the bridegroom came back for his bride and he would take her back to his father's house. When John sees this imagery, he shouts, hallelujah. Revelation 7, 19, I'm done. 11 through 17. And I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he that sat on the horse sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire and his, and his head were many crowns and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself and he that was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name was called the word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him, huh? followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with, that, 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 that with it he shout, he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he trotted the, 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 the winepress of the what? fierceness and the wrath of almighty God and he and he hath and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written king of kings and lord of lords and I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all that 
in the midst of heaven. Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper for the great God. We must understand that Jesus Christ is coming back again for his church. He is coming back for a people. I'm done, Terrence. So help me let, as I close this message this morning. As Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we live in eager expectancy of the Lord's return. But until then, your faith will be tested. Until then, your faith will be attacked. But God has dispatched me to Pisgah on this, the 22nd day of October, to encourage each and every one of you. Be faithful to God. And he who has been faithful over a few things, God will make you ruler over many things. Huh? And uh, the promise is given. If you are faithful, God will be with you. Be faithful. Hold on to God's unchanging hands. Do not be distracted. Keep your eyes. Keep your ears. Keep your heart fixed and focused on Jesus. Can I give us some biblical history as I close? I've seen the church in Eden hiding from God, covering herself with fig leaves. But God declared to the church, I will cover you with my righteousness. I see the church in the antediluvian world washed away by the flood. But God had a church with seven faithful members and one faithful preacher. And the church, the Bible said, uh, survived the flood. I see the church in Sodom and Gomorrah when the, when the Lord said, I only need about 50 faithful people. I will spare the city. But the church dwindled down to Lot and his two daughters. I declare this morning, I see the church in Egyptian captivity making bricks with straw but God sent a man and called his name Moses and told Moses go ahead and tell Pharaoh let my people go that they might serve me I see the church in Babylonian captivity thrown into a lion's den but God shut the lion's mouth I declare I see the church thrown into a fiery furnace because they made up their minds to be faithful servants of God huh? but God protected them in the midst of the fire and, and the Bible says God brought them out on scathe I, I see the church in the New Testament lied on sped on falsely accused abandoned denied betrayed hung on an old rugged cross huh? crowned with thorns adorned his head he hung his head and then he died they buried him in a tomb but early Sunday morning I see the church raising himself from the dead I see the church facing persecution stoned and beaten and tried and imprisoned but I heard Paul and Silas singing from that prison songs of joy songs of happiness songs of thanksgiving I see the church in ah uh, incarcerated on a rocky mountain called Patmos it was there John heard the voice of Jesus saying blessed are the dead who die in Christ from henceforth they rest from their labor and their works shall do follow them. I declare, I see the church from Patmos with John, uh, who saw a number which no man could number from every nation and kindred and tongue and people entering into the gates of the holy city. I declare, I see the church uh, militant becoming the church triumphant. I see the church uh, marching through the pearly gates. I see the church uh, taking off his priestly robe and putting on his kingly robe. I declare this morning, I seen the church uh, putting an end to sin and sickness, suffering. I see Jesus coming back for his his church a church without spot a church without wrinkle a church that is perfect I see Jesus coming back for his church so I can sing lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring Jesus 
is coming again. We have this hope that burns in our hearts. Hope in the coming of the Lord one day. The bridegroom father will call his son and say, son, this is the day I've been waiting for. This is the day I've promised you all along. This is the day you're going back and bring your bride. I can hear God the Father summoning Gabriel. Gabriel, go to the music department. Get your silver trumpet. Gabriel, my time is now. Can I preach it as I leave here today? Gabriel, I'm wrapping things up. Gabriel, I can see all the angelic hosts gathering before God the Father. I see Jesus taking off his priestly robe and putting on his kingly robe. I can hear Jesus declaring, right on, King Jesus, no man can hinder me. I hear the crowd shouting, ah, Jesus is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. My Bible tells me that one day Jesus will put an end to sin, suffering, and death. Daniel declared that one day Jesus will stand up. So Jesus, my friends, is coming back again. He is coming back to save us from our sins. He is coming back that no matter what the enemy sends your way, no matter what difficulties and challenges and trial and adversity may come our way, we must understand, understand that Jesus wants us to be faithful to him. John, praise team, come, we're done. John was faced with a trial at Patmos. But John made up in his mind that he will be faithful to God. John was determined in his heart that no matter what happens, he will remain faithful to Almighty God. That is my word to Mount Pisgah. As I stand before you the last time as your pastor, be faithful. Be faithful. This is the closing days of earth's history. And why says the final movements shall be rapid ones. So we come to church. We come to church to praise God. We come to church to build our faith in God. We come to church so that the people in the church might be strengthened through your presence. We come to church so that God's kingdom might be exalted through your life. This is not the place for political maneuverings. This is not the place to wield strength and power. This is God's church. God expects us to minister with authenticity and integrity. My prayer, my prayer for us is that you will be faithful to God. Be faithful to the work. Use your gift for God. Lastly, I will say as I take my seat, there are too many in our church who God has gifted and you come to church and you do not have a responsibility. You come, fold your hands, pout, sit down, and complain. You are here, we are here, as a part of the body of Christ, to lift up his name, so that through your life, others who are here might be strengthened in God. That's all.